This is the BioCentury Show. Brought to you by BioCentury Grand Rounds. Join BioCentury and Insights partner McKinsey & Company this September in Nashville for an R&D forum at the interface of industry and academia. I'm Steve Usden, Washington editor of BioCentury. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Rick Bright, and we're going to focus on the H5N1, or avian flu outbreak, and the U.S. response. Dr. Bright is a virologist and former director of the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, BARDA. The first known avian influenza outbreak was in 1997 in Hong Kong. 18 human cases were detected, six fatal. Today, it's June 11, 2024. The world has had 27 years to prepare for the inevitable. Avian influenza has infected hundreds of millions of birds, either killed by the virus or culled to prevent its spread, just over the last three years. In March of this year, it was detected in cows in Texas, Kansas, and New Mexico, and it's jumped to humans. At least three farm workers have been infected. Live viruses widespread in unpasteurized milk, and dead virus particles have been detected in pasteurized milk. The virus has also spread to mice, foxes, cats, and other animals. As we learned in Hong Kong, avian influenza has the potential to be far more lethal to humans than COVID was, or is. This is either the first stages of a major outbreak or a fire alarm that will test the preparedness for an avian flu pandemic. Either way, the necessary steps are obvious. Conduct surveillance, develop and deploy diagnostic tests, create manufacture vaccines at a large scale, develop therapies to help those who are infected. Rick, how's the world doing? How's the U.S. doing? <laughs> well, I, I shouldn't laugh. Um, you know, Steve, I like to tell people that um, we are, as a world, as a nation, better prepared for an influenza pandemic than probably for any other pathogen outbreak that we might encounter. And I also say therein lies the rub. We think we're ready, but most of the things we've done in the past to prepare for an avian influenza um, pandemic are either outdated, um, you know, still somewhere back on the shelf collecting dust, or just still not, you know, enough. And we haven't done enough to close those gaps. So my worry is when you say, how are you doing? I think we are overly confident. We're being a bit complacent and we're missing some really important signals that could help us get in front of what could be a devastating outbreak. So in, in that um, kind of sequence of things, that, that I mentioned, let's start, just like run through them. Surveillance, you know, wastewater surveillance, looking for antibodies and blood samples, other forms of surveillance. If you were at BARDA now, you know, what would you think the government should be doing? Um, and what is what is being done? No, we, we're in the dark on this outbreak. I mean, we still don't know how we're, first of all, we don't know where this virus came from. You know, is it, it just it, one wild bird introduction and it infected a cow and now it's spreading cow to cow? Are there ongoing introductions from additional wild birds and the cows around the, the country? We don't know how broadly this is spread because we don't have that surveillance testing being done in animals. And we don't have the surveillance testing being done in people on the farms or even close contacts of, of those who are infected. And one of the challenges that we're learning about this as outbreak continues is there's a, a reluctance for farm workers and sometimes farm operators or owners to let the federal government in with the testing that we have. So it tells me as an innovator and entrepreneur that there's a gap in our testing technologies that um, allow us to test more people and maybe do it in a more private way or more anonymous way, if you will, to be able to get this important surveillance data that we're missing. Right now, we have a lot of workers who are um, non-documented immigrant workers, and this can become an immigration challenge in getting the information we need. And the last thing they want is for someone from the federal government um, coming onto the farm and and testing them and, and, and monitoring them in some way and potentially having to deal with immigration issues for them or their family. So those challenges are there. We're aware of them. We're not getting the data we need. We're flying in the dark. To me, that's an innovation opportunity. And that's what I'd be focusing on at BARDA. And, and uh, the things that were kind of pioneered or at least advanced um, in the COVID pandemic in terms of looking at wastewater 
um, looking at, I don't know, stored blood samples, things like that, things like that. Are those things being done? Uh, so those are amazing um, advancements in technology that we saw uh, in the COVID response. You know, the testing that moved from centralized laboratories or just one lab at the CDC, centralized laboratories around the country, but then moving into point of care in your doctor's office and into your home and onto your body. That's a tremendous advance in our testing capabilities. And right now with H5N1, we're back to, there's one lab at the CDC that can really, that the FDA is authorized to do the testing. You know, we also saw advancements in environmental sampling, such as the wastewater monitoring. That made a tremendous um, difference in helping us to track just not only where SARS-CoV-2 was during the COVID outbreak, but also we were able to pick up new variants much sooner in the community wastewater than we were in the clinic, for example. Those new technologies are being now leveraged for the H5N1 outbreak, although it's an emerging and evolving science, the way the CDC is using it is still kind of generic, where we have some really good labs. So there's a great group in Texas called TEFI, and there's a group uh, that barely is supporting called Wastewater Scan from Emory University and Stanford. They're taking this to the next level where you can actually capture these viruses in the wastewater and you can sequence those viruses to see what's emerging. And you can tell if it's H5N1, not just influenza A. And so we need to get those innovations into those federal labs and into those state labs so more people can take advantage of these and we can better understand how this virus is permeating our communities and where it might be coming from. And, and what do we need to do in order to be able to get those kind of point of care diagnostic tests that were they were really late in coming, but they were they were still critically important for COVID? You know, the government needs to invest in those. Industry will respond. Entrepreneurs will respond if the government makes money available. And so the government has to prioritize and understand the value of a rapid test in the home that can detect H5N1 or even just H5 instead of just flu A. The reason that's really important, and I think it gets lost on a lot of people, we have some rapid tests that can be used in the home. Very few of them actually in the U.S. have been approved, but we have some, but they would just tell you it's flu A or flu B, influenza A or influenza B. And the reason I know it's important to distinguish between influenza A and H5 is because number one for H5, you want to get treatment right away. If you're a high risk individual with an immune compromise um, health system or, or older, of course, you want treatment quickly anyway. And the antiviral drugs that we have really only work most or best if they're given in the first two days. If it's H5N1, all previous studies that have been done in treating patients with H5N1 virus infections have shown most likely it takes a higher dose of drug and maybe a longer treatment course to really manage H5N1 because they grow to much higher, tighter, or they replicate much better in people when they're infecting people. So to have a rapid test in the home that tells you it's H5 can tell you that you need a different course of treatment than just a flu A. And it also means that you need to have those antiviral drugs close to home as well, or tied to a test to treat program that can get you that drug within the first two or three hours after being tested. So you can start taking it quickly and realize its greatest benefit. And, and that's something that we don't know if it's going to be needed now or not, but we know it's going to be needed someday. So it's not like investing in it now, even if it doesn't turn out to be a massive um, outbreak, it's not wasted money. It's going to be something that would be really important. No, see, we need to start advancing our diagnostic testing and putting them in the hands of people who need them so they can start answering the question, what do I have? What does my child have? You know, we have a lot of one-off tests. And when I travel around the world, I see, you know, medicine cabinets or, or big storage cabinets full of one-off tests. So if you can guess sort of what you have or might have based on the syndrome of syndromic analysis or symptom you have, you might run one test and get a negative and run another test and get a negative, run another test. You might have to run four or five of these tests. Now we see that some manufacturers are coupling up some of these tests. So you have a rapid test that can distinguish SARS-CoV-2, RSV, and influenza A and B. And there's probably only so much you can put on one of those strips, but it just 
speaks to innovation and what we can do and what we can build and put in people's hands that can answer the question, what do I have and how do I treat it as quickly as possible? And I think that's going to improve public health care around the world more than almost anything else. So, so one thing, you talk about science, you talk about um, public health. One of the things that um, strikes me is that there's a kind of a backlash, actually, against science and public health. And, and I see it in the uh, H5N1 situation with raw milk, unpasteurized milk. Uh, FDA has said that uh, unpasteurized milk can be contaminated with live H5N1 virus. And incredibly, when they put that news out, sales spiked and people actually marketed it and said, the FDA doesn't want you to have this, so you should you should do it. What's going on? You know, people have lost their trust in government and they've lost a lot of trust in science as the, we experienced so much controversy and conflict throughout the um, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, the COVID pandemic. And we haven't regained that trust yet. And I think now is an opportunity when we're dealing with this outbreak of H5N1, we're dealing with other outbreaks that are coming into our country and around the world that are spreading around the world too, such as MPOX and others. It's an opportunity for the government, the government scientists to be honest and be transparent and rebuild some of that trust. And then when they make a statement such as the highlighting the dangers of drinking raw milk, people will trust it. When we talk about now the dangers of drinking raw milk, we don't really tell people why. And we, we kind of say, well, we've always said drinking raw milk is bad for you and dangerous and can contain bacteria and a few others. Now it also has some of this H5N1 in it. But we don't go all the way to tell people clearly the real risk that they're putting themselves and their family under by consuming this product. And I think people just don't want to believe it. And it opens the doorway for rapid um, influx of misinformation and disinformation. So someone promoted something earlier this year that really said, if you drink the raw milk, then perhaps you'll build up some immunity to this virus as a way of protecting you from getting infected from the virus where it to spread. Now that is completely false and, and it should have been shut down, but even the government didn't respond swiftly and clearly to that type of information. And they didn't counter it with the real risk that can happen because I don't think the government is ready to tell people exactly how dangerous it would be to get infected with this virus by consuming raw milk. Vaccines, you know, it's been known for decades that the old fashioned way that flu vaccines are made in um, chicken eggs doesn't work very well for influenza vaccines. You know, you stand that, in terms of creating, you know, an H5N1 vaccine that, that isn't based on, on chicken eggs, you know, have we got um, the technology? Have we got the logistics um, ready to make massive amounts of vaccine in yes. chicken egg free um, production processes? You're pushing my buttons. You're pushing. I'm sorry, I keep jumping in on you on this yeah. one. But yeah, I mean, speed. The name of the game here is speed. And so, you know, regardless of how elegant your medical counter, your drug, your vaccine, your test might be, if it's not available in enough quantity in the right place at the right time, it's basically useless. And so, if you have a technology that you know can make vaccines, a technology we've been using since 1940s that says we know how to make influenza vaccines in chicken eggs. But if that technology cannot hold or withstand the surge needed to protect the world from a virus such as H5N1 that is spreading like wildfire, then it's practically useless. And what it does is it opens those doors for inequity, like we saw even with the, the COVID vaccine. So those countries that have egg-based production for vaccines, for influenza, will have those, and they'll hoard those, and they'll share those at, at, at the last moment and oftentimes too late in many parts of the world. And by the time they get them there, those vaccines are expired or the virus has moved on. So it's really required that we modernize our vaccine production technologies. We were lucky to have that momentum in the COVID pandemic where we introduced new technologies such as the mRNA-based vaccine technology. Now, we don't have an approved or licensed mRNA influenza vaccine yet, although three different companies have started clinical trials to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of an mRNA-based vaccine against influenza. One of the risks that we face, 
in addition to um, making most of our vaccines in eggs is the sheer volume of eggs it would take. But we also know that vaccines, influenza vaccines that are made in eggs mutate in that process. And when they mutate in that process of production in eggs, they drift away from being the most effective they can be for the human immune response. They become more bird-like or chicken-like. And so we have to reduce the chance or the risk of a vaccine made in eggs, drifting away from the target immunogenicity that we want it to be. And by using synthetic technologies such as live virus vectored approaches or mRNA or other recombinant-based protein technologies, we can reduce that risk. We can hone in on the type of vaccine that we think will be most effective, and we can make much larger volumes of those faster. So that really shows you where we need to pour our energy and our investment once again into modernizing our influenza vaccine enterprise. And and do you get the sense that that's being done, that the U.S. government, the governments around the world, because it's going to have to be government that does it, is taking this seriously enough and um, directing the resources that are needed to create that um, that capacity? We're starting to see rumblings of it. You know, I was leading uh, the uh, the program in, in BARDA for many years. It was the Influenza and Pandemic, Emerging Pandemic Threats Program before I became the director of BARDA. And we had a strategy in place to transition our vaccines for influenza from eggs to a cell-based production system to a recombinant-based production system. And we started on investing in mRNA-based vaccines for influenza. And that's about the time that COVID hit us. And so that technology was warm and ready and luckily positioned enough and advanced enough that we could take, drop in a spike protein from SARS-CoV-2 and it worked. And so we've learned a lot in that process. So the investment now from the government should be in accelerating additional work for influenza vaccines in mRNA. And we shouldn't put all of our eggs in one basket, even of mRNA. We've also learned the value with Operation Warp Speed of having multiple shots on goal. You know, some of those will work, some of those will fail. Some of those that work for COVID won't work for influenza, and some that didn't work for COVID will work for influenza. So we should be investing heavily now in a range of platforms that can modernize our influenza response for rapid pandemic response. That includes not just our traditional vaccines that we put in a needle and syringe and inject in our arm, but we should be transferring those vaccine technologies to patches so we can more easily administer those through the skin. We should be looking at oral-based vaccines that can be swallowed and provide protection that are room temperature stable so we can ship those to more people more easily. There's a number of different innovative approaches. We got a good start on some of those during COVID, And we kind of left them at the altar after COVID started to wane a bit. We need to go back there and re-engage, reinvest, and accelerate those over the finish line. Yeah, and the other thing that we learned from Operation Warp Speed was the value of having that certainty of um, payment, of reward at the end of the line. So that's one of the the companies that invested massively in vaccines knew that if they succeeded, there was going to be a big market for them. That's exactly right. We're hearing that now. We're hearing from some test developers and some vaccine developers that indicate they would assume some of the risk and, and, and make some of the investment or their investors would, would, would jump in now as long as there was some commitment from the government to procure or buy those tests or those vaccines when they're ready. And the other part that's really critical for the success of companies taking risk and government taking risk that was probably one of the most critical components of Operation Warp Speed was the regulatory alignment and the regulatory commitment. The FDA made a commitment with specific teams for each technology to be able to review data quickly, respond quickly, and keep everything flowing so they didn't hit those delays we typically see when someone submits something to the FDA and waits for approval. There was that alignment, there was that commitment, there was a clear and constant communication between the company and the regulatory authorities. And that was one of the things that helped grease those skids to make sure that vaccine was delivered on time. Well, well, great, Um, Rick, we're gonna have to take a little break now. And when we come back, we'll talk about the last thing I was talking about, which is the need to develop better therapeutics. Great, thank you. (laughs) 
This September in Nashville, BioCentury launches Grand Rounds, a new interdisciplinary R&D forum at the interface of industry and academia. Join BioCentury in a rich roster of innovators and key thought leaders to identify leading edge discoveries and discuss urgent challenges that must be solved to translate these innovations into product development and medical practice. Meet academic innovators, physician scientists, early stage investors, and biopharma R&D leaders for two days of networking, partnering, and debate. Register at biocentrygrandrounds.com. I'm back with Dr. Rick Bright. Rick, therapeutics. Um, you know, we've got basically we've got two for flu now, Tamiflu and Relenza. Neither one of them is great. They both need to be administered within a couple of days of symptom onset. And there's concern that a virus could could mutate um, to evade either one of them. What do we need to do? What's being done to create better therapeutics? See, this is a really important component of an effective response to seasonal influenza and pandemic influenza. And I'll, I'll correct you just a little bit. We do have a third um, influenza antiviral that was approved a couple of years ago called Zofluza or Biloxivir, also made by Genentech and Roche. And it is an antiviral drug that works on a different part of the virus um, to be able to neutralize that virus. And what's really remarkable about that drug is it is a one pill administration or one pill dose. And unlike Tamiflu, you have to take two pills um, you know, twice a pill twice a day for five days. This is one pill. And so compliance is going to be much better. And they also have data showing that when you take Biloxivir or Zofluza, it reduces the viral load pretty quickly in a person. Therefore, it can reduce transmission to others in your household or close contacts. So that's really a great improvement. And it gives us some options to have in our, our arsenal to combat influenza. The challenge is that it is also vulnerable to mutations in the virus that would develop resistance or antiviral resistance to those drugs. Back in 2004 and five and six, I did a series of experiments at the CDC when I worked for the CDC. Um, my project was to monitor for drug resistance. And we had another class of drug at the time called the adamantanes that were M2 channel blockers. And I developed a rapid uh, test that can monitor influenza viruses for resistant to that drug. And upon developing that test, I discovered that every drug, every virus circulating the planet was already resistant to that drug. So it was a matter of no one was checking. We were still using an ineffective drug for so many years. So now we have these tests that can show us how resistance will develop to the, the, to the neuraminidase inhibitors, which is also Tamivir or Tamiflu, and Zanamivir or Relenza. We also have a test that would show us resistance to Biloxivir or Zofluza. And what we know is resistance can and will develop very quickly. And there are a number of studies that were published in 2006 showing that patients who were infected with H5N1 in particular, um, who were treated with Tamiflu, within one or two days of treatment in that same patient's resistance developed and the resistance spread that resistant virus spread. And in 2007 and 2008, in our seasonal influenza viruses, we saw that almost every one of them that was circulating was resistant to Tamiflu. And one of the lucky strikes, if there's such a thing, in the 2009 H1N1 pandemic of influenza was that that pandemic strain actually brought back in sensitivity to Tamiflu. So we could use it initially, but it only took three months of global spread before viruses were resistant. So that's a long story, a long way to say we need more treatment options. We need more um, quivers in, in our, in our um, arsenal to be able to, or arrows in our quiver, we'll say, to be able to treat this. But we also have to think of this in a whole different way, Steve. Influenza viruses, when they infect a person, they trigger inflammation. And this inflammatory response is oftentimes something that causes more damage and harm than the infection of the virus itself. What we don't have and we should be investing in 
are treatment options or therapeutics that will modulate our immune response, will modulate inflammation and that cytokine storm. And they can be broad spectrum. They can be work against a number of different viruses or even bacteria that we might see. You wouldn't develop resistance to them and they can keep you from being severely ill and actually can keep you from dying. So we need much more energy in those broad spectrum, host targeted, anti-inflammatory treatment options to complement our arsenal of antiviral drugs that target the virus. And and like with COVID, like with um, uh, AMR, these are things where there isn't going to be a natural market for it necessarily, right? It's going to have to be jump-started by government and propelled by government, or, or it's really not going to happen. That's exactly right. That's the role of BARDA. That's why BARDA was created, to bridge the valley of death, to support the development of these drugs, vaccines, and tests that often don't have a, a large commercial marketplace downstream. If there is a commercial marketplace, we want to still support and develop them and get them approved and let some of the marketplace forces take care of that, which we do with some of the influenza antivirals. But at the same time, we stockpile those drugs in our strategic national stockpile. And when there's a spot shortage or a a really bad influenza season, we push those antiviral drugs out to the marketplace to help fill those spot shortages. If there wasn't government support, we wouldn't have those drugs developed. Those are really expensive clinical trials. I've spent, um, while I was in BARDA, over three or four or five hundred million dollars just con- conducting phase three clinical trials for new influenza antiviral drugs. So no small entrepreneur or biotech company can invest that much money in a drug with a limited marketplace. BARDA was created to bridge that valley of death, accelerate the development to FDA approval, and in some cases stockpile and procure those drugs to make those available so they're there when and where you need them. And and is it getting the support it needs? Is it getting the financial support it needs to do that? Is it getting the leadership that it needs to do that to 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 do what, like you said, what it was created to do? Well, I'll have to say I'm going to focus on influenza right now. Um, I don't think they're getting the support. I don't think many on Capitol Hill really appreciate the need, the cost and the um, gaps that we need to close with our ability to respond to something as rapidly moving and potentially fatal as influenza and pandemic influenza. I, I, my yardstick on this is for several years, before I left BARDA, I have a notebook of briefings that I gave on Capitol Hill to senators, to, to Congress people, to um, appropriators, to um, authorizers, um, showing the gaps we have in our influenza response plan and the tools we use to respond to influenza. I could show that it would take, you know, six to nine months to make enough flu antigen in our egg-based system just to make the doses for America, let alone the rest of the world. And it would take several months more to make the adjuvant we need to add to them, several months more to make the to have the filling formulation and filling capacity we need to put those in vials and syringes, and then even months more to just to have the needles and syringes we need to administer them. So I had my little um, slide deck, um, loaded it with data, loaded with the right rationale, um, loaded it with statistics from the President's Council on Economic Advisors that showed how costly and devastating economically a pandemic would be. And I was begging for money, begging for funds to address those gaps, and we didn't get them. And through the years, we have very small contributions. It's always been one of the smallest budgets in BARDA, and we had to make do with what we had, and we had to scale back many of our readiness capabilities. We had an egg contract, of all things. Imagine a contract that ensures that we will have you know, 900,000 eggs every single day available for nine months. And there were uh, Congress folks and appropriators that would come into office and, and beat me up over why we have a contract that ensures we have so many eggs. And what do we do with those eggs when we're not responding to a pandemic? And we worked all that out. But there was not always, and I still don't think there is enough support to fund the things that need to be funded 
to modernize our approach and our response capabilities so we have a dynamic readiness position and posture for pandemic influenza. And do you think also that there's there's um, the public will, the political will, but also the public will to to do what would be needed if we got there, if we even if we if we get an effective vaccine, if we get diagnostics, if we get therapies, has the COVID backlash been so severe that, that the country would be in danger of not even deploying the tools, even if we um, even if we get them? COVID backlash has been that severe, and there's a, a strong divide between those who um, believe in vaccines and some who just outright don't believe in the value of vaccines, and that divide has gotten worse over time. So we have to acknowledge that that exists, and that also needs to be a work plan that should be addressed now, not in the midst of a next crisis. We should be addressing that now to rebuild the trust, to work on communications. I was really excited to see um, one of the states um, a couple of days ago posted the guidelines for um, personal protective equipment for farm workers. And before last week, the CDC said they put them in English and Spanish. And one of the states, I think it was Washington and Seattle, um, put out these guidelines in multiple languages. It's a recognition that the people that are important to reach and educate and build trust with don't just speak English and Spanish. And we have a, an amazing country with a wide diverse population of amazing people that speak different languages and have different issues and have different trust boundaries. And we should be doing everything now to bridge that trust, working with local trusted messengers in COVID, it was um, the, the ministers and, and the, the church leaders um, and the barbers and the hairstylists and beauticians. And in this H5N1 outbreak, maybe it's also the farmers and the veterinarians and the, the people in the um, food supply that we need to find ways to reach, to communicate and to build trust because it is that community of people we're gonna rely on for the information to be able to get in front of this virus and to rely on to be able to take um, these treatments or do the right things to help control the spread of it once it starts spreading. But if we wait until it's a crisis, once again, that trust hasn't been rebuilt and it's only gonna get worse because we have such campaigns, strong campaigns of misinformation and disinformation. And I think you mentioned the things, the public health things that would be needed in addition to vaccines. You know, I think the thing that jumps to everybody's mind is social distancing, um, having um, schools shut down, having to um, stay, people um, stay in their homes and things like that. And there's a tremendous, tremendous concern that something like that might happen again. Some of the things that were in the playbook that were done for COVID were actually created with the idea of a flu outbreak, with the idea that you would take these measures to protect people until a vaccine was ready, for example. Do you think that if we have to go through this, something like this again, um, you know, is the country gonna, gonna do it? Or, or are there things that have been learned from the COVID experience that could, could lead to better ways of um, deploying public health measures so you'd get more public buy-in and a consensus around it? You know, it's gonna be really hard, Steve. And what I think is most important is that we do everything we can to stop it, to keep us from getting there. We have amazing tools if we use them now with our testing and our the therapeutics and the, and the vaccines that we've talked about. We can do a lot right now by maybe vaccinating animals. We can even make vaccines available to those at highest risk. We can do so many things to keep this from getting out of control. And unfortunately, what I see us often doing is a wait and see, wait and see. Let's see how bad it gets before I do the next step or see how much worse it can get before I do more. And it has to be really bad before we start pouring money on the problem to really put things in place to accelerate. And if we do that, once again, that should be a lesson from COVID, that should be a lesson from H1N1, from Ebola, from Zika, from MERS, those should be lessons learned. That if we do something different this time and try to detect it early and nip it in the bud, maybe we won't have to deal with some of those really difficult challenges um, soon anyway. 
Um, but we should actually still be educating people about the value of those tools, about the value of social distancing, about the value of hand hygiene. And, and I think during 2009, we taught people to sneeze into their elbow instead of their hand and, and touching everything. Um, we should we should start thinking about those campaigns. We should start educating people now. I think they'll help them in everyday um, protection from bacteria, from other viruses, and they'll be especially helpful in a crisis such as a pandemic. So I want to want to end in kind of with one of the things that that you've been kind of been a theme of what you've been talking about throughout our conversation, which is this um, need for innovation, this potential for innovation for mobilizing. Um, the biomedical industry to 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 rise to the occasion. What do you think needs to be done? What what could be done to bring um, to bring the industry and all the the innovation and um, resources that the industry has to bear to, as you said, you know, nip this one in the bud and be better prepared for what things might happen in the future. Well, one of the things I think is really exciting that it doesn't get much attention at all, and they're certainly not getting funding, is uh, our ways to bring uh, modern technology, large language models, supercomputing, artificial intelligence into this battle. We talk a lot about making more of the same stuff we've had and teaching people how to use these stuff that we already have. You know, I think there's opportunity to use um, AI-derived um, computational analysis of these antigens of these flu viruses and make a better influenza vaccine and use that as the sequence or the antigen that we would put in the vaccine that can give us better protection, maybe better protection against how, the ways the virus might mutate so we don't have to have these discussions about having one dose of vaccine or two or three boosts or four boosts or nine boosts, whatever it might be, what if I could use modern technology to design a vaccine that would future proof it from that variation and that need? What if I could use AI nowadays that we're seeing to where how it makes better antibiotics and in ways and challenges that we couldn't make a new antibiotic AI has now been used to make three new antibiotics to address some bacteria and drug resistant bacteria that we had a challenge addressing before. And so I don't see yet how the government and industry and investors are bringing and merging the future with the past to make our response even better. And I think some initiatives in that area by government and fueling some funding and prioritization in those modern approaches will help make our response not just better, but also more efficient. We don't have to spend a billion dollars and take 10 years to develop a new drug. If we can use AI to understand where the outbreak's occurring with our diagnostics tied in, understand where populations are that might be at greatest risk, and help us come up with the right inclusive representative data set and clinical trial to get the right data sooner much less expensively, much more efficiently, and have a drug available to save lives even sooner. That's and, why I'm excited about innovation and where we're going in industry and biotech. And, and, and it seems also that, that those same kind of technologies could be used to um, pinpoint where you need to deploy resources, where you need to take public health measures, so you're not having some kind of a blanket, um, a blanket approach that affects everybody in the whole country when when you can actually identify um, spots where you can kind of ring fence the, the, the virus. Absolutely, and it can also help in supply chain management, understanding where you have a glutton of supplies and where you have an abundance of supplies and, and help you manage where and how and when to shape and shift some of those supply chain materials or raw materials. I have seen amazing AI algorithms that show us how to synthesize existing drugs in new ways that don't rely on a single raw material source in, in, a, in a remote part of the world, for example, that where everyone's clamoring to get the same um, starting material, perhaps AI can show us that you can make the same drug, same equivalent, using five different ways of, of starting it, five different types of starting materials. And so we can change the way drugs are made, and we can change, when we change how they're made by changing the chemistry, we can also change where they're made. They don't have to all be made in one big factory in one country or a few countries. We can reduce that footprint, change the chemistry, change where they're made, improve the access, and we can actually clean up the environment with some of that approach too. 
Well, oh, oh, great. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. We've actually gone over time, um, but this is really um, both fascinating and um, and urgent. And thank you again for taking the time today to talk to me. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. And thanks for, for all your viewers, because it, it, the people uh, that are listening to this who can make a difference and who are leading the way. Brought to you by BioCentury Grand Rounds. Join BioCentury and Insights partner McKinsey & Company this September in Nashville for an R&D forum at the interface of industry and academia.